Hello, NEMA friends. I'm Darren Pomeroy, and I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives for the William G. Pomeroy Foundation. We're delighted to be a conference sponsor again this year. NEMA has done a wonderful job with this dynamic virtual program, and we hope that you've had a rewarding experience. The Pomeroy Foundation is back again because we want to help you celebrate your community's history. And one of the main ways that we do this is pr providing fully funded grants for roadside markers at no cost to you. It's clear that markers make an impact, whether it's educating the public, promoting historic tourism, or encouraging pride of place. As of today, we have funded over 1,200 markers and plaques nationwide across our various marker grant programs, including Legends and Lore, which you may have seen in the conference program. Before the conference wraps up this week, make sure to stop by our exhibit booth to learn more and to enter our $100 Amazon gift card giveaway. Or check us out at any time on our website, wgpfoundation.org. We want to hear from you, so let's connect. Hi, everybody. I think we're on and going. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us today uh, and welcome to our panel discussion where the museum things are. A look at museums in uncommon places. My name is Dan Wallace and today it's my great pleasure to introduce you to three professionals deeply involved in doing the hard work of museums in unexpected places. As we progress through the next hour, please feel free to post any questions you may have for the panel in the chat. I'll bring them up over the course of the conversation or at the end of our hour together. Before we dive in, I would like to take a moment to recognize that all the spaces that we inhabit come with a rich history to learn, acknowledge, and interrogate. Today, I'm coming to you from North Adams, Massachusetts and the beautiful Berkshires. It is with gratitude and humility that I acknowledge that we are learning, speaking, and gathering on the ancestral homelands of the Mohican people who are indigenous to this land. Despite enduring tremendous hardships in being forced from here, Today, their community still thrives in Wisconsin and is known as the Stockbridge Muncie community. I pay honor and respect to their ancestors past and present as we commit to building a more inclusive and equitable place for all. Throughout the last several days, we've been asked to define who we think we are now. When we first proposed this panel back in the before times, the four of us thought we had a pretty good idea. We were each experienced collaborators secretly posing as museum professionals working in the gray areas of organizations and communities that sometimes didn't know what to do with us. We thought that we could share how the challenges that we have faced to get our missions to the public could maybe help you reframe your own problems. The now part of that question has been a hell of a monkey wrench though. In a way, our core identities are exactly the same. Everyone on this panel is deeply and passionately engaged in their work, but other things have changed. What each of them brings to the conversation of the now is a curiosity and flexibility that's essential to our future as a profession, paired with the ability to seek over the horizon for new ideas and connections that engage with people proactively. Each of them have developed their particular skill sets in challenging environments, and each has proven themselves to be highly adaptable. So without further ado, let's meet our panelists. Sam Aquilao, and I'm sorry, I'm going to always mispronounce your last name. <laughs> That's okay. Is a, founder, <laughs> is a founder and executive director of the Design Museum Foundation, a national network of local design museums operating in three sites in Boston, Portland, Oregon, and San Francisco, and growing across the country. Their mission is to educate the world about the importance of design in our lives. Design's everywhere, so the museum has no permanent address. Instead, Sam and his team have turned the museum inside out and turned entire cities into locally focused nomadic design museums. Sam earned his BFA in industrial arts, uh, industrial design from the Rochester Institute of Technology and went on to design consumer electronics for the Bose Corporation, as well as teach at Wentworth Institute of Technology, the mighty mass art, personal plug there, and Babson College where he earned his MBA. With a passion for design, creativity, and learning, Sam creates a long-term vision for the museum and leads a dedicated team while managing key programs and strategic operations. In 2013, Sam and his team were named one of Boston Inno's 50 on Fire. Our next panelist is Sarah Coffin. Sarah is a museum professional with a BA in history from the College of Worcester in Ohio and an MA in museum studies from Harvard University. 
since 2010, she's been working for the Boston Red Sox and was appointed the first, the very first curator for the team in 2017. Sarah works to use the history of Fenway Park and the Red Sox to educate fans and visitors on the importance of baseball in Boston. She manages the Red Sox archives, which houses more than 200,000 artifacts, including photos, baseball cards, equipment, and historical documents. Using these resources, Sarah has created countless exhibits inside and outside of Fenway Park with topics such as music at the ballpark, Fenway at 100, and the greatest generation, baseball in World War II. Our third panelist is Rob Dome. Rob is a public historian and museum professional who has worked in maritime museums since 2005. He earned his BA in history from the University of Michigan and an MA in public history from Loyola University, Chicago. After beginning his career as a historical interpreter at the USS Constitution Museum, Mr. Joan joined the curatorial staff of the Norman Rockwell Museum in 2008. From 2010 to 2012, he served as a curator of the Beverly R. Robinson print collection at the U.S. Naval Academy Museum, where he oversaw the preservation and interpretation of approximately 5,000 historic prints depicting European and American naval history. He has presented papers to the Society for Military History, the McMullen Naval History Symposium, and the Maritime Heritage Conference. He is currently the curator of the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, where he oversees the museum's collecting and exhibition programs. So we start off with why a museum. Each one of these institutions would, on the surface, not look like they would have uh, uh, collections to present to the public. In some cases, as in Sam's, he's generating something completely new. Can each of you talk about your organization, the work you're doing, and any example projects you would like to share to set the scene? Can you address some of the challenges that you face in regular operations and why a museum is something you have managed to convince the powers to be to support? Sarah, can we start with you? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, as Stan said, uh, my name is Sarah Coffin. I'm the curator for the Boston Red Sox. When we look at Fenway Park, we don't immediately think museum, right? It's a ballpark. We're regularly asking 38,000 fans to come in and watch a baseball game, not necessarily learn something. Um, my job came out of the 100th anniversary of Fenway Park and looking at, you know, the importance of its history back in 2012 when we were celebrating being around since 1912. The idea that the entire ballpark is a museum. Every place you go is history, but it's still a living, breathing entity for baseball, um, which does not necessarily coincide with all of, our all of our thoughts about museums. We have an incredibly rich history, um, but we're definitely a non-traditional setting. So instead of having one museum space that you'll see at some of the newer ballparks, um, we have 21 displays throughout the ballpark. And these can range from Fenway and the Greatest Generation, which is what you see here on your screen, all the way to, you know, different pieces um, that basically anywhere you go in the ballpark, you're gonna see something. We actually have a hundred plaques through, in and throughout the ballpark, denoting all types of different events that have happened, all the way from uh, Carlton Fisk's very famous home run in game six of 1975, all the way down to a plaque commemorating a fan who used to bring cookies to the, to the ballpark to give to the players. We're looking at all the different angles of history um, within literally just one uh, square city block. When we started talking about this panel and thinking about you know, museums in uncommon places, uh, the, one of our exhibits came to mind immediately, and that's our historic Fenway Park ticket booths. So this is a photo of our ticket booths in 1967 when they were literally being used for just that, ticket sales. People came in through gate A, purchased their tickets, and could either go straight through the turnstiles if it was game time or turn back, turn back around and go back out onto uh, Jersey Street if it was not. And these historic structures had been there since the beginning, since 1912. In 2002, uh, they were taken out of operation for tickets and instead pretty much sat dormant until 2009. Um, this is the way they look today. And these historic structures were not taken out. Instead, they were repurposed. Um, 
this happened before my tenure, but it is now very much my job to oversee this exhibit and to work within all of the constraints that it gives. These are literally pieces of history that are some of the first things that people see when they walk in through, through gate A. They're gateways into our history and they just scream that they need, you know, exhibits and to space within them, but they come with incredible challenges. Uh, one of the prevailing feelings that we have in baseball, um, as well as in, you know, my work as a curator is don't tell me no, tell me how. So these ticket booths are nowhere near exhibit cases. Some of them didn't have ceilings when we first started. They have pieces of their past uses, whether it's telephones, wires, different lighting. Uh, they were not created for this use, but they do give us a, sh a very unique window into what life was like at different intervals um, within our history. There are things that we do with these that a you know, traditional museum setting wouldn't necessarily do. There's lighting issues. The fact that they're almost literally inside and outside creates an exposure issue that's pretty much unlike anything I've dealt with before. To deal with this, we basically said, okay, what can we put in it and how can we tell this story while also uh, preserving all of the things that are really important for collections? We don't wanna damage anything. We want the artifacts to shine, but we also wanna make sure that we preserve them for a long, long time. How do we do this? Regular condition reports, making sure that we've changed all the lighting over to LED, passive climate control, basically anything that we can do to make sure that these actually do function. We have an emphasis on things that have already been outside, whether it's ballpark signage, bases, uh, and other things that have already weathered the storms of New England winters, so that being in a museum case is not that different for them. The other thing is we use replicas, paper replicas, photo replicas, magazines, you name it. Um, if there's a piece that is not gonna withstand these conditions, we use something in its place. We still wanna tell the story without causing any damage to the artifacts themselves. This is not something that a traditional museum would say, yes, this is exactly an exhibit space, but this is something that is very prevalent with what I do at the Red Sox. And I think it would be very detrimental to, to the stories we're trying to tell to not use spaces like this. And with that, I will pass it over to my next panelist. Rob, we're gonna speak with you uh, as well. Um, can you catch us up on some of the hurdles that you face and how your work as a museum in coordination with the War College? Yeah, absolutely. So um, again, hello to everybody. I'm Rob Doan. I'm the curator for the Naval War College Museum. I do need to give a quick disclaimer first, just because I am a federal employee, which is to let you know that all the views in my presentation are mine alone and do not necessarily represent those of the Navy. So with that out of the way, um, <laughs> What I want to let everybody know about our museum is that um, we have a lot of obstacles that we have to get past, but that's part of the challenge for me. We are a museum that is located on an island inside the perimeter of a Navy base in a 200 year old building that used to be an asylum that was built on a smallpox burial ground. <laughs> so <laughs> we got that going for us, as they say. Um, but this shows you kind of the, our setting um, with the red arrow is pointing to our building there. Um, we are in the building that was the original building for the Naval War College when it was built in 1884. Um, the college was established in those days because the Navy realized that um, the training that officers received uh, as part of their career was uh, not really adequate in those days. All officers at that point went through the Naval Academy and once they graduated from the Academy, that was really the end of their training and everything else they learned in their careers, they really just got by on the job training. And by the late 1800s, the Navy realized that really just wasn't enough. So they created a school, a new school, to train higher ranking officers in the kinds of duties that really only more senior officers need to know about people who are going to be captains and admirals and that kind of thing. So that's why the college is there. Um, we at the museum were from, begun in 1952. The, the college decided to establish a historical collection. We were originally part of the library when this was all established in 1952. Uh, in 1964, the building where we are now was registered and, and listed on the National Historic Landmark as part of a historic landmark district. And in 1978, we split off from the library and actually became our own, uh, our own separate entity. Um, 
the uh, the college today has about 600 students. There are about 10,000 people total who work on the base, and um, all of those people are considered part of our audience. Um, although we are called the Naval War College Museum, and we certainly serve the needs of the college as much as we can, um, we also have other audiences that we have to be mindful of, of uh, serving their needs as well, and that includes all of the other schools that are on base, um, as well as the general public. Um, we are a fairly small museum, um, about uh, 5,800 square feet, two floors, six galleries. There are six permanent staff um, and about 10,000 artifacts in our collection. We, um, because of the restrictions for getting on base, and this is our, our main challenge, <laughs> the general public can come and visit us but it's not easy. Um, if you want to do that, you have to call advance and basically set it up with us several days in advance. And you have to apply to get a pass to come on to the base where we're located. And all of that can be done that it just takes time though. And the casual visitor to Newport who's there in the summer for a wedding maybe and just finds out about us you know, one morning and wants to come that afternoon, it's probably not gonna happen. It, it takes uh, you know, a couple days for this process to work. So. Um, but nevertheless, we are tasked with serving the public's needs. So we um, have tour groups from the college that come through, um, student groups from some other schools on the base that come through our museum and we give tours to, and then um, have things like school groups from uh, schools around Rhode Island that come, and then just the general public. So for us, um, given the challenges of getting people there, our, our question has always been, how do we get around that obstacle? And um, <laughs> I'm only half joking when I say that the pandemic is sort of really not all that new for us because we've always had to try to figure out ways to get outside our building and, and uh, bring our product to, to a wider audience in different formats and different venues. So one of the ways we do that is uh, this slide is showing you our lecture series. We have a public lecture series that began actually running in the museum, but we eventually decided we really, uh, uh, instead of trying to fight the security restrictions for getting people on base, it was really easier if we just took the lecture out into uh, the town of Newport. And it's been at a couple different places, but we now host it at Sale Newport, which is located right next to Fort Adams in Newport. And uh, the, that's open to the public. Anybody can go there. There's no, no checks needed. So um, our lecture series has done very well there. And we definitely see rising attendance. Um, with our military audience on base, we try to do something similar like that. This is a, a program that is new. We haven't actually run it yet, but it's kind of in the developmental stages of doing a staff ride for the students at the college. And a staff ride, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically like a walking tour of a battlefield, but it's geared toward a professional military audience. So the idea is that you actually walk the ground uh, where a battle occurred and, and you know get out maps and look at the letters and the orders that were given and try to understand the mindset of the people who were in charge that day and the difficult decisions they had to make and and why everything turned out the way it did. Um, Rhode Island, Newport itself was the scene of a pretty large battle during the revolution and it isn't well marked or preserved but um, you know if we know kind of where the sites were we can take students around and and do um, a nice educational product for them by going around to those sites and, and doing a historical review. So that is in the works but um, those are two examples of things we did in the pre-COVID times even before when we've always been struggling to get people to come to the museum and, and that those are examples of how we kind of went outside the gate and tried not to wait for people to find us but go out there into the public and, and uh, do as best we can. Very active so engagement. With that, I will uh, turn it over to Sam. So Sam, you started out as a really interesting idea. Um, you, in 2008, you kind of broke open this idea that you could do a museum as a startup. Can you tell us more about what you've done since then, how you've fulfilled your mission and, and what you've been working on currently? Yeah, definitely. Thanks everyone for being here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so we've been a non-traditional museum uh, since the beginning, uh, which I work, like Rob said, kind of works out pretty well in the pandemic because it's really, it's nothing new. Uh, we might be the one panel that didn't have to change our topic too much based on the changes in the world. So that's, that's kind of nice. Uh, but yeah, so I started uh, the design museum with this idea that it was important for people to understand design and see how it impacts their lives and see 
you know, not only the art form behind it, but the strategy and the, the collaboration that happens to create everything, create the world around us. Um, and so here's an example of our, uh, this is our last exhibition before the pandemic. Uh, it's called We Design, and it's all about uh, people of color who are working in design across many different design fields and talks about the uh, need for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the field. Uh, this was done, this is a great example because this exhibition was popped up at the bowling building in Roxbury. And um, that goes to show, our, our museum, we have no building. That's sort of our unique uh, approach. I, when I started the museum, it was in the last recession. Uh, so here we are again. Um, and uh, it's like a mark, <laughs> badge of honor, just little badges <laughs> for recessions that you've survived. Um, you know, but being a small museum at that time, we had to be pretty scrappy and, and there wasn't a lot of money to go around. And um, so to be both capital efficient and the uniqueness of our subject matter, right? Our collection is literally everything around you. Like this was designed, this handkerchief was designed, everything, right? I, I joke that everything is in our collection. That's my, you know, my white man confidence coming out pretty strong. Um, and so that need to be capital efficient our real estate costs are effectively zero. And because our subject matter is everything, the museum is uh, different words you can use, pop-up, nomadic. Uh, some people say virtual, that is us now, but we are very much real in the pre-COVID times. Uh, and we do everything that a traditional museum does. We do exhibitions as is another shot of we design. Uh, we have various uh, regular lecture series um, around design. Uh, mostly themed by our different impact areas. So whether it be design in healthcare, design in cities, uh, design in play, sustainability, et cetera. Um, do typically do a annual conference around those impact areas. So this was uh, something around workplace innovation. That event is happening in a couple of weeks, but will be fully, fully virtual. Uh, we do a lot um, with education. So we have um, a mix of both adult and youth education. This is a photo. This was a relatively new program, just squeaked it in right before the pandemic, um, where we partnered with uh, Cambridge Public Schools to teach design to teenagers. And then they did real projects in their community uh, to make impact. Um, so yeah, we, we have a lot of challenges in terms of like, where are we doing our next program? I don't know. We really live in this, um, level of, this is again, pre-COVID, live in this world of uncertainty and also um, partnership and collaboration. I, I always like to say that our bricks that build our museum are the collaborations that we have throughout the community. Like we are nothing without those. And so, um, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting time <laughs> to be a unique museum and to figure out how to be even more unique in, in the times that, that we're in. So <laughs> there they are. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of, before we get into talking about the, the situation that we find ourselves in right now, um, Sam, you were talking about how you've really leaned on collaboration um, as a, a way to draw people together. My follow up would be like, what talents and skills did each of you have to build in order to be successful in your roles? Um, and when you were building those, those um, skill sets, how did you work with your organizations and how did it kind of reciprocally change your organizations? Um, uh, because I know like working with a college, working with a ball club and then working with a large community like Boston and now Portland, San Francisco and wherever you can go, there's a lot of back and forth that happens. Can you talk a little bit more about that? And whoever wants to go first, please do. Yeah, I can jump in just to continue that thought. Um, I'd say the biggest skill and you mentioned it in your intro, is, is adaptability. And I think that runs through everything that we do. I have this mantra that change is good and that <laughs> we just roll with the punches. Uh, part of not having our own space means, like, what do I own <laughs> besides our, our collection, our, our content? And so uh, something that I had to develop a skill around adaptability was being okay not owning everything and being you know, able to morph and massage programs to fit not only the mission of Design Museum, but the mission and the desires of our partners. 
because now it's not just a design museum thing, it's a Cambridge Public Schools thing as well, or it's a Roxbury Innovation Center thing as well. And, you know, it was tough initially, right? Because I was this vision for what this museum could be. But again, being a unique museum without a home, that collaboration, that adaptability is essential because clear, you know, at the end of the day, people have to want to work with us. That's our number one core value at Design Museum. It's right up there on the list is that we're the nicest people in the room <laughs> because we have to be. <laughs> if people don't want to work with us, we literally have nothing. We have a website. Great. <laughs> Um, and my team knows that core value and they live it every day because we know every relationship, every partnership is essential. I'll, um, I'll jump in and it's definitely the adaptability uh, piece that Sam was talking about is um, incredibly important in what I do as well. Uh, flexibility, you know, I am surrounded by people who are in baseball, it's in business. These aren't museum minds. Um, so when I sit down at a table with folks, I'm um, trying to explain something that could be a completely foreign concept. Um, I remember uh, using the word accession in a conversation and having everybody kind of look at me funny and I said, oh, okay, let me explain what accession means. Um, I joke at times that I am the Lorax of the artifacts that I speak for them in the sense that we come up with a concept for a display and, um, you know, we find a place to put it and then, you know, I'm the one talking about, hey, you know, we want to make sure that this light source that's coming in from the side isn't going to damage what we're putting here or, you know, the fact that this is next to a hot dog cart, you know, there could be humidity issues that go along with it. So I'm kind of speaking uh, in that sense. Um, and that was part of the reason why this became where the museum things are. Uh, I'm always kind of thinking in, in that sense. Um, but then the other big thing is just willing, willingness to find solutions and willingness to ask for help from others. I am, you know, always calling on other museum professionals that I know because, you know, no one else in my organization is a museum professional. So instead of going across to somebody else's cube, I'm calling up another museum and saying, hey, what do you think about this? Um, and just not being afraid to ask those questions because you'll find unique solutions with other people that you may never have even thought of. So I'm always open to talking to others and other groups. Um, and that's why doing this NEMA thing was so important um, for us and for our museum setting. And Rob, that level of coordination must be part and parcel all the way up and down the chain for you. Yeah, that's exactly what I was gonna say. The ch chain, um, you know, being part of the Navy, we're obviously part of a very hierarchical organization. Um, we're also a university museum. Yeah, and that's kind of its own category of, of museum. Um, but whether it's the college, uh, kind of the academic setting of the college or the Navy, yeah, I think our, you know, our, one of our challenges in, in dealing with the COVID times is um, kind of working within our, our structure and the fact that um, we don't have direct control over a lot of the things that I would like us to be able to where we could adapt really quickly. Um, and a perfect example of that is our website. Um, we don't control our website <laughs> at the museum. That's actually, it was run, it was created uh, for us by the, you know, an IT department in the Pentagon basically, or on the Washington Navy Yard, but it's in DC anyway. <laughs> so, um, and although they, you know, there was sort of an attempt to, to ship these things over to the museums, it's never quite worked out. And, and you know, we, none of us really quite know exactly how to use it and, and change it. So. There are things like that where, um, you know, resources that kind of uh, a normal museum, I guess you would say, runs out of their own space, we don't. So, um, you know, in the piece that I'm going to show about one of our programs, the, the live wargaming program, um, you know, that's something that I might normally think that we might want to run off of our website where you just have to come to our website to watch it. That would be probably an impossible task for us just because trying to coordinate with the people in Washington and, and get <laughs> permission to do that and, and make the changes would require so much and, and um, you know, filling out forms and making requests from, you know, all different offices. So we don't necessarily work in the most uh, uh, structure that's easy to adapt. So we kind of have to use what's available to us. And, and <laughs> much like the, just the challenge of getting people onto the base, um, I think the lesson for us is don't try to fight it. Just, you know, find the tools that already exist out there that let you do what you want to do. 
Um, you know, when it comes to getting people on the base, the base isn't going to change the security protocols just for us, the museum. You know, we are like the last on the list of concerns they have for, <laughs> for security regulations. And then just like with, uh, you know, internet and, and uh, online related things where we, we kind of have to just use uh, the tools we find out there that we have and we can do without asking anybody's permission. And that, that really, you know, lets us do things quickly and, and deliver content in a timely manner. Rob, you touched on the war game situation that uh, you've been developing and, and releasing. I think this would be a great jumping off spot, spot to uh, present that and just show what's happened. I'll start with a really quick screen share on this side about some of the um, sure. historical shots of where this is coming from. And then if you want to take over and, and show people the video, that'd be great. Yep. Okay, right. great. So for us, um, as we were thinking about, uh, you know, once <laughs> once the museum shut down and once we were pretty much pushing everything we could to online platforms, the question was, what can we, what kind of program can we do and what can we share with our audience? And of all the things that go on the college, I think the, the aspect of it that generates the most interest is wargaming. Um, what you're seeing here is a photo of, a, of a, a game that's being run at the college in the 1930s. Um, the Naval War College is kind of one of the originators for professional uh, wargaming for the U.S. military. Um, going back to 1887, when it really became part of the core curriculum and it's developed through the years. You see here, this photo is from the, the 1930s. And you're seeing, you know, basically, <laughs> these, are, these are commanders and captains in the U.S. Navy down on their knees, pushing little model toy ships around the floor. <laughs> and that's... It's funny to see it, but um, you know that's a training tool that they used, and 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 uh, it's changed over the years. Of course, it's now it's all computerized. They don't do this anymore on on their hands and knees. But um, a lot of the senior naval officers who held high command positions in World War II kind of learned their craft by doing this, by this war gaming. So. For our visitors, they're always asking us about this. They're always asking us if they could watch a game in progress. And unfortunately, I have to tell them, no, I can't even watch one. Um, these are things that are, you know, as you can imagine, pretty highly classified. And none of us at the museum have a clearance to go watch one of these things in process. So I can't show you what an actual Navy war game looks like. But, um, you know, the fact that it is a game is kind of an in for us. Um, people like games, you know, they like to play games. And um, they're curious about, you know, how the Navy's games differ or are the same as, as what they know. So, um, you know, with the explosion in popularity of, you know, both board games, but then computer games too, now is a really perfect time for us to be um, uh, kind of showing the crossover and, and how um, games are used, not just for fun, but for, for to train the military. So, um, what we did was took uh, an existing war game. This is not something we created. I'm not a programmer. I have no idea how to create one of these, but we took one that's just available on Steam. Um, if you're familiar with you know, computer games, um, you can go to Steam and buy just about any game you can find. We took a very simple World War II themed game. It's called Memoir 44. And um, I got in touch with the curator from uh, another one of the Navy museums. We're part of a system of Navy museums. There's 10 of them around the country. So I challenged the curator of the Puget Sound Naval Museum <laughs> in Washington State to, uh, to play me in this game and she accepted. So um, I'm gonna show you a clip of, of her and I playing this, uh, this game. Um, the other important thing I wanted to say before I play it is, is uh, the thing that I learned, and maybe people know already, but I have to admit this was new to me, is that there is an absolutely enormous audience of people out there who want to go online, not to play games, but to watch other people play games. <laughs> if you're familiar, I mean, if you've been on YouTube or Twitch, or you know, if you're a gamer yourself, or you have people in your house who are gamers, you probably already know. But this is what the um, kids are doing these days. <laughs> this is what the kids do <laughs> exactly. <laughs> But uh, yeah, the people who, you know, I mean, there are people who are like professional game players, basically, and, and they have followings of millions of people who, who watch them live stream. So I knew there was a way to kind of harness that to show them what we do, too. So that's basically the idea of what we're trying to do here. So 
this is a program that's really geared more towards the general public. I, I wouldn't expect much of a professional military audience for this, but if there were some, you know, that's great. But the idea for basically for us is to show, you know, take a simple game and, and kind of talk about um, how it's similar to the games at the college and how a professional military officer might approach it. So let me go ahead and share my screen and see if I can get this going. All right. We're coming at you. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. We're only getting audio, right? Yeah. Move him up there and him right there. Rob, you might want to see. And this guy, I think I. We're seeing your file. Get into oh, trouble. Yes. So I'm actually. Hmm. Uh, I thought I'd done that right last time. Let's see. The audio was very exciting. <laughs> let me let me stop the share again here. Let me try doing it one more time. Okay. Can you see the video queue up on the I'm here to tell you what, let me start this first. Shoot. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to totally take a mea culpa on this one because for the audience at home, uh, what we, we were putting the slides together, we had a little bit of an issue with how I had set it up and it wasn't translating correctly. So I've unfortunately put Rob in a position where he's going to have to adapt on the fly. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, let me, uh, I'm going to try this one more time here. Let me, no. Yeah, I don't know why that's not working. I thought we'd worked in our little test drive there, but. Let me see if I can queue up your video in the background. Um, and okay. in the meantime, let's go over to Sarah. Um, she has obviously faced an awful lot of challenges in regards to um, getting people actually even into the ballpark uh, during the course of the season, as everybody probably knows at home. Um, it was a truncated season uh, to begin with, and then uh, there have been no fans, um, which for a ball club is going to be a little bit difficult. Um, can you talk more about what you've been able to do to adapt to the situations? Yeah, no, if anybody watched the game um, at all this summer, you know, the fact that there were empty seats was not something that we dealt with, um, you know, very often in Boston, we have an incredible fan base. Um, and so to see to see the ballpark empty was just the strangest phenomenon in, uh, that I've ever experienced in my all my years of, of loving baseball. But um, what we were able to do and adapt is, you know, use all of our uh, virtual, play, you know, virtual avenues we already had. Um, so it gave us an opportunity to collaborate more with social media, to work with our marketing team more. This is a camera setup. Um, a remote camera set up in the ballpark. So people got unique perspectives, unique views, um, and we're kind of, everybody had a vantage point of being right at the action, um, even though they were uh, safely at home. And the, it also created uh, the first opportunity for us to work with digital exhibits. Um, and that's something that we're working on, on creating now. Uh, we are so much of a business where it's so important to get people in the door that the concept of a digital exhibit um, is really now making sense uh, for us as well, given um, that we, you know, we need to be able to reach audiences um, in unique ways, specifically from the museum um, standpoint. We've also ramped up um, some of the outgoing education initiatives we already had. Um, one of the experiences that we're working on um, is a sing-along, <laughs> which will, um, so people will be comfortably singing at home, hopefully. Um, but the idea is that organ music is so tied into the history of the ballpark and, and how people, how fans experience things. Um, so we're working with our organists to create programming um, that can go into, into people's homes. Um, we cannot wait until we can have baseball back again. 
but the good news is, is that we can still use the ballpark and people's love of baseball as a vehicle uh, to keep learning even through, even through the pandemic. Sam, can you give us a little insight as to what you've been doing as well during the times? Yeah, we really, um, again, back to this whole idea of like change and adaptability. We were really quick to pivot um, pretty much everything we do to be virtual. Um, so I mentioned we design, and you saw that image before at um, the bowling building in Roxbury. We brought that entire exhibition onto our website. And so folks can check out all the content, you know, certainly no artifacts, but photos and, and video. And um, I mean, the fun thing about this has been, we got even more <laughs> people in the door, uh, people around the world um, have been checking out uh, this exhibition and we've been hearing from college professors saying that they're including it as required reading. Um, I mean, it, it helps <laughs> very much that, you know, the times that we're in around uh, racial injustice and rebirth of civil rights movement, this is uh, perfectly aligned. Um, and so it's been really interesting to try to, you know, like Sarah was saying, how do you bring an exhibition <laughs> to be digital? Mm -hmm. um, but it is so funny in terms of this section of our talk. So, and I think our strategic planning consultant, uh, Laura Roberts is on, so maybe she remembers this. But when we were writing our strategic plan, not that I have something like crystal ball here, but I kept telling my board that we have to be a media company. We have to embody all of the platforms and approaches that, that a media company would do. And I remember in that meeting, the board being like, no, we're a museum, we're already unique enough. Let's hold on to what that means. And I was like, oh, really? So Laura and I really squeaked in some of these key media initiatives and I'm so glad we did because that's where we were able to very quickly pivot with COVID is we just went into the strategic plan and said, what are those media things that we were going to do five years from now? Let's do them today. And uh, digital exhibitions were certainly one of those. Um, we also brought our education programs online, which was inc incredibly interesting um, and challenging sort of in a twofold way. Uh, this slide is showing... Um, a collection of activities that anyone can just do on their own. So uh, we call it Design Together. A teacher, a parent, guardian can download lesson plans um, for these various activities and do design projects. So that's kind of our like broad, anyone around the world can do this. Uh, by the way, during right at COVID, we changed our name <laughs> from Design Museum Boston, Design Museum Portland, and we just combined it all into uh, Design Museum Everywhere. So people all over the world could check this stuff out. Um, but we still, you know, are locally focused as well. And so we brought our, that teen program that I mentioned, we adapted that to be virtual over the summer. And so also extremely interesting, very quick pivot, but I know the students, teachers, parents, guardians all really appreciated um, that. And we're gonna do it again uh, in the spring virtually um, and so we're going to keep, keep doing that. That also might allow us to scale our team program uh, to be larger. And then getting into more like the tradition, like traditional media or, or more media things, we, could, we do tons of events in the pre-COVID times. We couldn't do them anymore. And one of our strategic plan things was to launch a podcast. Um, you know, and, and we're like, well, if we can't do events, we can't have like a lecture series, we can have talks. Like, what if we launch the podcast now? And so... Uh, we did it. We had no idea what we were doing. Bought some <laughs> microphones and some fancy headphones and uh, learned a lot about what it means to have a podcast. So now we produce a weekly podcast called Design is Everywhere. Um, it's got thousands of listens per episode, which is more than 50 people <laughs> who might come to a in-person event. And so, so the scale is just totally different and exciting, frankly. Uh, for to be a small museum and to have that um, that ability, and then uh, continuing. Um, oh yeah, there's the podcast. There's a podcast. Sorry yeah, about yeah. that. No, it's all good. Yeah, check. It's on every podcast platform you can think of: Spotify, iTunes, Google, etc. Um, in fact, we had a new episode go live this morning. Uh, and then um, print media. So really early in the oh there they are. It's like I'm recreating the slide with my face in the middle. <laughs> uh, we had done a Kickstarter campaign that ended on March 13th. 
Um, and so I'm very glad that Kickstarter campaign ended. It was successfully funded. And uh, that allowed us, we had an existing sort of like newsletter, print magazine type thing. And it really allowed us to elevate the print magazine to be, you know, as we found the team now, now it's a real magazine. Um, and now we're, you know, as we say, we're the museum that comes to you. Like we literally send the museum to you. Um, and then the last thing I'll mention too, and, and you know, Dan had the slide up, but just our, you know, print books, like being able to take the exhibition home was the thing in the past. Now it's like, this is your exhibition at home. And then last thing I'll show you, this is super exciting. Um, we're taking our exhibitions and turning them into um, like card decks that you literally can have at home. You could spread these out on your table. There's different like prompts and activities, you know, and like prompting questions that you can do. And that's just, again, that adaptability of what, how do we get our content into people's hands and into people's eyeballs. <laughs> uh, and we just have to, um, yeah, in my mind now, we at least, you know, temporarily uh, transitioned from being a nomadic museum to being a media-based museum. Yeah, it was, it was almost scary to see you make the pivot so quickly because, you know, it, when the pandemic started hitting, everybody started to close down and everyone was talking openly about what to do next. Um, uh, I was like, oh, I wonder what design museums up where. And you had already like rebranded, re like put the website back up. And I was like, no way. You had this <laughs> like, you know, 48 hours compressed at, into six. It really felt like, so it felt like we were starting up all over again. It was that level of activity. My team was working. I mean, everyone was like, frankly, we, you know, and this is, I'm, I'm never, I love museums and I love traditional museums, never change, like, or change where it makes sense. We don't have, you know, precious artifacts that we're housing in a particular place. So it's very different, but we did say, and I'll, I'll share, like, when this all happened, we were like, okay, this is either a terrible, it is, it's a terrible situation, or is this our moment? And I'm glad we landed on the you know, after it wasn't, I wish I could say it was like so easy, but it was like, this could be our moment to really pivot and build our audience. And um, I don't know, as, when I talk to my board now, I'm like, are we able to exit the pandemic better than when we went in, which is extremely exciting and, and humbling uh, to all the work that went into it. Sarah and Rob, did you also find that there were things in your suitcase of things that you wanted to do that you were able to uh, bring out and and uh, advocate for within the your institutions as they kind of scrambled to meet the challenges of the past eight months? I think for us, um, the um, yes, the answer to your question is yes. We uh, we did find I know. I don't know, maybe about, about the end of the summer, July or August, that um, the concern, I think, that for us that was coming down um, kind of from our higher level headquarters again in D.C. was the fact that all the Navy museums have been shut down and closed to the public. And we're a publicly funded museum. And so there naturally there was some question of will people want to know, like, hey, we're <laughs> taxpayer dollars go to this museum, you're not open. So what are you people doing anyway? <laughs> like, you know, are you doing something mm -hmm. or, you know, what are we getting for our money's worth basically? So um, trying to do more to show the fact that, you know, exhibits are just one portion of, of what a museum does. And that even when we aren't open to the public, we're still taking in donations. We're still looking for history to preserve. We're still um, doing conservation on our collection. And then, of course, educational programs. So um, I think, by the way, I think I figured out what I did wrong earlier. So do we have time? Can I make one more attempt? <laughs> we, are, we are 10 minutes out. Um, oh, okay. Right. So it's going to be a little hard to get it in. But okay. again, I apologize. It was entirely okay. my fault. Well, all right. <laughs> we tried anyway. Sorry, it, uh, it worked in rehearsal. How can I say? <laughs> don't know what went wrong there, but uh, oh well. I, think I can, maybe I can, what I can do is put like in the chat or in a question, I can put a link to the video on our Facebook page so you can at least go there and watch it. Yeah, that would be great. About. Yeah. I think in terms of pivoting for us, the biggest thing is that we talked about digital initiatives and, and, and doing some um, 
different kind of digitization projects or launching some exhibits online or doing some of the things like that. And, um, you know, I think a lot of times we came up against, okay, you know, we're, our, our business hinges on people coming in the door. Um, so we want things to be leading. We want, you know, people to get a taste and then come to Fenway Park. And I don't think, um, I don't think anybody is going to now tell, um, you know, say that a digital initiative is not a great investment of time, um, mm -hmm. you know, so I think in that way, it really helps. Um, but, you know, it wasn't something we'd really started before. And so it's just given me a great avenue to expand that um, and to reach some audiences um, that, you know, for various reasons may not come to the ballpark as often or come to the ballpark anymore. Uh, I work a lot with our senior population, our 65 and older population. And, you know, these are people that watch every single game or listen to every radio broadcast and to have avenues to continue to reach them um, is really critically important and something that um, maybe we hadn't seen before the pandemic. Thanks. You know, now that we have a little under 10 minutes, um, I'd like to answer some of the questions that are coming from uh, the group who's tuning in. Um, Sarah, can, uh, Sam, can you speak a bit more about the process of building community partnerships? Um, what are the challenges and logistics? And were people generally receptive to the idea of the design museum when you started out? And kind of a follow up, like how have you built the um, uh, people being evangelical about uh, evangelical about your your mission? And yeah. that's coming from Lauren Scharf. Oh, nice. Hi. Um, yeah, in the early days, I will say people were like, this is an interesting idea, but there was a, so much you know, uncertainty with the recession that it was difficult to get traction, especially you know, as a startup. But I think the chord that we did strike early on was that, especially in those times, recession times, and including now, even though this is a totally different kind of recession, that the work that we were doing in the public was bringing vibrancy to the city and therefore people were into it. They might not have exactly understood <laughs> that we were trying to be a museum like in the public realm, but they were excited about how it brought people together and it was exciting and it was visual. And that um, allowed us to, um, like when I, when I build these partnerships for you know, an in-person exhibition, I'm talking more about that. I'm talking more about activating a space and bringing people to a space and how exciting that is. And that, that's the language of, you know, when I might, might be talking to a real estate developer or a university, you know, if we're doing it in their lobby. Um, so that's the, you know, that has been the, the transition. And then, uh, you know, it's probably obvious, but as our brand, as we, people are more aware of who we are and what we do, it's, it has been easier over time to make those partnerships happen. They take time. I mean, partnering with the city of Cambridge and the Cambridge Public Schools was a year long process before they would even, you know, let us near the kids, which sounds a terrible sentence. Um, how yeah. did you make those inroads? Like, how did you, how did you, you know, show up with your portfolio and say, hey, this is what we do. This is what we can offer. Um, was there a yeah. lot of investigation? Did you get introduced to individuals who made those decisions? Yeah, it comes back to the, and I had forgotten the second part of the question, but it does come back to community. And that is like this magical, it's hard to define <laughs> what it is, but um, you know, truth be told, someone from MIT had come, into one of, had come to one of our events at Google, loved what we were doing. The event was about youth education and design and um, she had mentioned that there was a group in the city of Cambridge, Cambridge Public Schools, thinking about STEAM, you know, thinking about um, art and design and education, and um, that she'd be open to introducing. And um, how do I say this with the most diplomatic? Sometimes groups can just, there's a lot of talking and not a lot of action. And that's kind of where this group was. Everyone's heart was in the right place. My whole, you're probably getting this, tendency is towards action. And so, we came, we listened to what they were needing, which was how do we infuse design into the, these teen programs. And um, I think we came out with, with twofold of ideas for action and then also funding. So we said, let's, you know, together we went in on a National Endowment for the Arts grant and money makes things real. And uh, we got the grant, we had built the relationships and the partnerships and, and then we were off to the races. Um, there's a question that's coming in from Matt Kirkman that had to do with um, 
do people want to engage with your spaces after they've done so digitally? Um, do people desire an encounter? And I know we're a little bit in the, you know, the very beginnings of understanding this question in specific, but for each of you, like, could you answer that since you've been able to have people physically within your space or interacting with you physically, an opportunity to outreach digitally, and then now we might start seeing people back within our shared spaces. Um, Rob, if you could talk a little bit about that, uh, what you've seen from the college side, Sarah, I know you're going to have to wait until the season starts up again, potentially, um, and Sam as well. The, the crazy thing about, um, you know, waiting for baseball to begin again is that, you know, it's, it's something people still love. You know, it's not an institution that's going away, um, which is great. And, you know, People, people will be beating down the door. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so, right? Um, but also, you know, I, I always say that, you know, um, people come, but the education piece is tough, right? So in a, in a regular year, we have 38,000 of our closest friends, you know, coming on a regular basis. And, and what I want to do is, is give them something to learn on their way out. Um, so if they're picking up a hot dog and they're seeing something that we've done next to that, that's fantastic. Um, and so now, you know, people are dreaming of when we get to go back to these spaces. And so it gives me an opportunity to, um, you know, use some of these avenues to talk about some of the, some of the things that maybe get sidetracked when we're playing baseball. Um, and so hopefully that's going to create more avenues to kind of reach people. Um, and, you know, it's tough. We're a, seas we're a seasonal business as well. So, um, you know, we're getting into the winter months and, and, but hopefully people are dreaming of, of spring training and, and summer and things like that. And, but so the good news is, is that we definitely have the time and the space to do it. How about you, Rob? Yeah, we, um, it's a little hard to say yet because we, we've been closed to the public since March and we still are, and it doesn't look like we're going to open anytime soon, unfortunately. So I, I haven't had, you know, I, I haven't quite been able to test, you know, for the people, you know, when we do our, our online programs to see, you know, if we get those people in the museum then again, and if there is that connection. But what I would say is that I, we definitely um, have that kind of at the fore front of our minds when we, we plan these programs. Um, what you would have seen in the game clip if I could have succeeded in showing it was, it wasn't just about playing the game. We also interspersed the game with um, kind of like intermissions where we do like an artifact spotlight that has something to do with, you know, the battle that we're playing in that game. Photos from we the area. We try to weave in a lot of educational content, um, partly because we want to show that this is not just a bunch of government employees playing computer games on your tax dollar. <laughs> I realize there is a perception problem there that we kind of need to address, but, but also because um, the nature of the game is that, um, you know, it is a game and it's fun to play, but we kind of, I always want to make sure that we are hammering home kind of the serious nature of what it's showing that this is obviously a really serious uh, subject that, you know, <laughs> war is not a game and it's not fun to play and it's not fun to be in. So we try to always kind of make that the point too of, you know, drawing attention to how many people were killed and hurt in this battle and, and you know, the incredible suffering that happens on both sides. So, um, highlighting those things i hope will inspire people to want to make the trip to newport too and and getting more of those kind of artifact spotlight pieces in there kind of gives us a chance to also show what is in the museum that you can't see right now but is here uh you know waiting for you so <laughs> yeah yeah I'll, I'll just add for us um i have no doubt that people are going to want to gather and connect when this is all over so that that's um, you know, we did have that question. We put our whole exhibition we designed <laughs> that we spent years curating, just put it on the website. Um, will people want to see it? Um, for one, one, I guess, a data point is we're already getting folks who want us to tour the exhibition to their spaces. So that's like great. Um, uh, it's when the time comes. Um, the real question for me, um, the pivot back for us will be more difficult than it was to pivot into this like digital world. And that's for a lot of reasons, um, and so, and it's exciting. But I'm more I'm our thinking now is like, what's this hybrid approach for us? Because there, like I said, there is so many good things mm -hmm. about these digital programs. I mean, we had we now have members, whereas before it's like we have members in Boston, Portland, and San Francisco. 
now we have members in, I, I think we're up to 45 states around the US in 18 countries. And it's like, that is so <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> now I can't just pivot back and be like, all right, we're doing our programming in our three cities. Like then that, you know, those yeah. members. So like I said, more difficult, but this hybrid approach is interesting because you can prototype stuff at the local level and then elevate it, connect with people at a global level and bring them to our community. So there is something magical to be done. And distribute what works. Exactly. Distribute what works. Really. That's the team program. Like it's so good. Like, can we do it in six cities virtually? Probably. Um, so yeah, it's exciting, uh, but it's going to be another one of those, you know, maybe hopefully it's a longer pivot process than it was going into the pandemic. I, I can use the, the, the gray hairs are really coming in. <laughs> Dude, really... you still have hair. It's not that yeah. bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, with that, we're just at 345 and we're going to wrap up and I want to thank all three of you, uh, as well as Thanks. everybody who attended this session. Uh, if we didn't get to your questions, we'll do our best to answer them uh, in the Q&A in the chat. Um, I also want to extend my thanks to our session sponsor, the William G. Pomeroy Foundation, and to the fantastic group of NEMA staff and volunteers who've made this entire thing possible. Uh, as a personal note to everybody out there, do good work, work that matters, work to, that will affect change. You're not alone. We are all passionate professionals with enormous skill sets that can be harnessed to the service of our, community, of our communities. There's a lot to make right in the world right now, and there's so much work to do. So with that, thanks guys. I really appreciate it. It has been wonderful getting to know you over the course of putting this panel together um, and look forward to seeing you, what the work you do between now and the next time we get to meet. <laughs> Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thanks, everyone.